Uh, we're going to conclude this hearing. I wanted to say a few words at the end. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Chairman Peters and Senators, the ranking members Blunt and Portman uh, for conducting this hearing in such a professional way. Uh, we had a bipartisan agreement on how this hearing would be conducted, who our witnesses would be, um, and um, also uh, the plan to have additional hearings, including one next week that we'll be announcing tomorrow with the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, and the FBI, because clearly we have and our members have additional questions. Um, I want to thank the witnesses, as I said, for voluntarily appearing uh, before us. I want to thank uh, Captain Mendoza for her moving words and bravery. In many ways, she represents all of the officers that were there that day. A few things that uh, are very clear to me. The first uh, is the uh, statements at the beginning uh, from all the witnesses. They may have disagreed on some details and, you know, okay. But there is clear agreement that this was a planned insurrection. So, and I think most members here um, uh, very firmly agree with that. Um, and I think it's important for the public to know that. This was planned. We now know this was a planned insurrection. It involved uh, white supremacists. It involved extremist groups. And it certainly could have been so much worse except for the bravery of the officers. Secondly, uh, we learned about the intelligence breakdown. So many of the members of both committees asked about that, uh, particularly the January 5th, the FBI report uh, that had some very significant warnings uh, from social media about uh, people who were coming to Washington who wanted to uh, wage war. Uh, the fact that did not get to key leaders um, in the sergeant of arms or the uh, Capitol Police chief is, of course, very disturbing, uh, really on both ends. I mean, you can't just push send. As we all know, we get tons of emails um, and uh, hope that it gets to the right person, especially when we're dealing with something so serious. Uh, the January 3rd intelligence report that was came right out of the Capitol Police also contained, according to Washington Post reports and other um, information, some pretty foreboding uh, details uh, that I would have thought would have resulted uh, in planning and more preparations. Uh, the delays in the uh, proving a request for National Guard assistance, both from the Capitol Police Board and the Department of Defense. Uh, the fact that the sergeant at arms were focused on keeping the members safe in both chambers uh, while the chief was uh, trying to get some emergency approval, to me, uh, you can point fingers, but you could also look at this as a process um, that is not prepared uh, for a crisis. And I think out of that, there's some general agreement, just based on talking to a number of members, um, that there should be changes to the Capitol Police Board, uh, the approval process, and the like. And it's clear that that action must be taken not only to uh, protect our Capitol, uh, but also uh, to protect the brave officers charged with protecting the citadel of democracy. Um, better intelligence sharing, always an outcome when there's failures of intelligence. We know that, but I think we'll get more details in the coming week. Some security changes at the Capitol, requests that have been made for a while on those changes uh, that I think we have to seriously consider. And no, it does not have to be barbed wire. Um, and of course, this is a public building and you want the school groups and you want the veterans and you want people to be able to visit here. But that doesn't mean that we don't make some smart security changes to this building. Uh, the use of the National Guard. We know after 9-11, uh, the National Guard helped for quite a while. We also um, uh, know uh, that we have to uh, have a plan going forward as well as consider what happens when we need a greater number of National Guard in a crisis and how those approvals are made. Those are just some of my takeaways. I'm sure uh, many others will have more, uh, but I do want to make it clear um, that there are some items of agreement uh, between most of us on this committee, and I don't think we should let the words of a few uh, become the story here, because I think this has been a very constructive hearing, and I want to thank our uh, witnesses uh, for coming forward as they did. Um, and I want to thank Senator Peters, and we look forward to more hearings. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Chair uh, Klobuchar. Uh, I, I have enjoyed this hearing. Thank you uh, for your leadership. It's been good in working with you and your entire team uh, with the Rules Administration Committee. And certainly want to thank uh, Ranking Member Blunt and, and Portman uh, and all of the members who came here together today to work in a bipartisan way to ask tough questions uh, and to, uh, to get answers. I want to thank uh, Captain Mendoza for uh, sharing uh, her experiences. Uh, certainly a very powerful way to, to start uh, this hearing. But I truly appreciate uh, each of the witnesses uh, that were here today who, who came here today willingly uh, and knew you would uh, be asked uh, tough questions uh, and you were willing uh, to do that. And certainly uh, we, we appreciate you for, uh, for that effort. And uh, while this hearing certainly shed some new light and offered some new information on what happened to the lead up as well as to the response uh, to the January 6th attack on our, our Capitol, it's also raised a, a number of additional questions uh, that need to be asked. For the past two years, uh, I've, I've been working to draw attention to the rise of domestic terrorism and specifically violence driven by white supremacists. We have only seen uh, the threat of this violence grow, uh, not just from white supremacists, but also from anti-government groups and people who have been swept up by conspiracy theories uh, and just simple outright lies. The events of January 6 and the, the answers that we heard today only further highlight a grave national security threat that our current homeland security apparatus is clearly not fully equipped to address. Our national security agencies were overhauled and they were forged in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks. And they're basically built around responding to foreign terrorist attacks. And they have been slow to adapt to this evolving threat of domestic terrorism that we have seen uh, in the last few years. The Homeland Security Committee was created to oversee reforms to fix the intelligence failures that led to 9-11. And now I intend to assure that this committee oversees efforts to fix the failures that led to the January 6th attack. There's no question our federal counterterrorism resources are not focused on effectively addressing the growing and deadly domestic terror threat. The January 6th attack marked a once in a lifetime failure. And now we have the duty to ensure that the federal government is doing everything in its power to make sure another attack like this never happens again. We must align our counterterrorism resources and our intelligence gathering efforts to ensure we're focused on this dire threat. The FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and the National Counterterrorism Center right now are eight months late on a report to assess the threat posed by domestic terrorism. And we're going to continue to push them to complete this report as soon as possible so that we can take meaningful action. There's no question in my mind that there was a failure to take this threat more seriously, despite widespread social media content and public record, uh, reporting that indicated violence was extremely likely. The federal government must start taking these online threats seriously to ensure they don't cross into the real world violence. I also plan to keep uh, the pressure up on social media companies to work harder to ensure that their platforms are not used as a tool to organize violence. So this investigation uh, does not end uh, here today. Uh, and I look forward to our next hearing uh, where we will continue to seek answers uh, to important questions that were raised today and others that need uh, to be answered. Before uh, we adjourn, however, I have to do a bit of quick housekeeping. Uh, it's my privilege uh, to announce the members of the subcommittees of the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee for the 117th Congress. The following senators will serve on the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. John Ossoff will be chair, Ron Johnson, ranking member, Tom Carper, Maggie Hassan, Alex Padilla, Rand Paul, James Langford, and Rick Scott. The following senators will serve on the Emerging Threats and Spending Oversight Subcommittee. Maggie Hassan, Rand Paul, well, Maggie Hassan will be chair, Rand Paul will be ranking member, Kirsten Sinema, Jackie Rosen, John Ossoff, Mitt Romney, Rick Scott, Josh Hawley. And the following senators will serve on the Government Operations and Border Management Subcommittee. It will be chaired by Kirsten Sinema, James Langford will be ranking member, Tom Carper, Alex Padilla, John Ossoff, Ron Johnson, Mitt Romney, and Joss Hawley. 
So congratulations to our new chairs, our ranking members, and to all members uh, of our committee. I look forward to working with all of you in the months uh, and years ahead. Uh, officially, uh, the record for this hearing will remain open uh, for until 5 p.m. on March 9th, 2021, for the submission of statements and questions uh, for the record. With that, this hearing is officially adjourned.